let's get started. It's pretty exciting, actually. Okay, so who's seen ads like this before? A whopping 18% rental yields. What NEIS housing scheme mean for property investors? Full disclaimer, this is not my ad. But who's seen ads like this before? And uh, what about on Google? So when I search NDI's property on Google, this is the first ad that comes up. I actually did this one live today. So this is as of this morning. 10 to 15% NDIS investment returns. NDIS investment opportunities. Who's seen, who's seen ads like this? I'm sure you have, otherwise you won't be here. What about emails like this? I get emails like this almost every day. You know, SDI, uh, SDA Homes, 12.5% yield. I'm sure you guys get a lot of emails. I'm sure you guys have seen ads and, you know, websites um, that speak to that effect. So the real question is, and the reason why you guys are here, I'd imagine, is are NDIS property investments right for you? Okay, so that's the, that's the key question, isn't it? If you guys want to just comment on the chat box and just say, yes, this is why you're here, um, that'll be great. Just let me know that you guys are, um, are actually uh, paying attention. Fantastic. Thanks, KN. Thank you for your uh, participation. And Lynn, great, great. Thank you, guys. Thank you. All right, we've got a pretty active uh, participants. Okay, so first of all, just a disclaimer. Um, we are not builders, okay? So we are not NDIS builders. We're not builders at all. We are not NDIS providers either. Uh, we are not specifically NDIS property marketers. Um, but what we will be going through, it will be analyzing the financial impacts today. So I don't, I'm not going to get into the political side of things or the moral or ethical uh, side of things. Um, I'm just getting into the specific financial components of NDIS properties. And just last disclaimer, um, this webinar does not contain any financial advice, just financial opinion and education only. Okay, so um, in order for me to really articulate what I want to uh, present, um, I, want to, I want to introduce you to John and RJ. Okay, so the photos here are obviously stock images. However, these are real member profiles. Okay, so I've got John here on the left-hand side. Um, he is an IT professional. Um, he's making about $150,000 in gross annual income. He owns his home, so principal uh, place of residence, which is worth about a million dollars. And he's got roughly about $500,000 left in debt. He's a first-time investor, which means he doesn't have any uh, investment properties at the moment and is not generating any passive income. And on the right-hand side, we've got RJ. Um, he's self-employed. Um, he pays himself $200,000 in gross annual income. He has, he has uh, his own home, which is also worth about a million dollars with debt of about $500,000 remaining. So far, he's accumulated three investment properties already um, with a total value of about $2 million and is about $1.3 million of debt owing in his portfolio. And he's generating roughly around $35,000 in net positive uh, 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 passive income through his portfolio. And both their goals is to generate $100,000 in passive income uh, within the next five to 10 years. So as I go through this webinar, um, I'm going to go through John and RJ's story and how that relates to yourself and how that relates to NDIS properties. But first of all, who the heck am I? So for those of you who haven't engaged already with myself and my team, um, I just want to spend just a couple of minutes introducing who I am, who we are. So number one, um, my company is called Three Monkeys Property Investments, and we're, to, we're here to help um, families reach financial freedom through real estate investing. And, um, and one of the key questions I get asked all the time is, why do you call your company Three Monkeys Property? Uh, and that's because I named it after my three cheeky monkeys. These are my three children. Okay, so please meet uh, three cheeky monkeys. Um, so what do we do? Um, so we are a wealth creation company, and this slide basically summarizes what we do for all our members. We help our members pay off their mortgage, so they get mortgage-free, help them retire with over $100,000 a year in passive income, 
achieving this within five to 10 years without costing them anything and have everything done for them. And a little bit, a little bit about myself. So as I mentioned, um, I named Cumbie Three Monkeys property after my three cheeky kids. Personally, I've been in the real estate game for over 21 years, um, and I've held senior positions uh, in a number of global real estate firms, such as LJ Hooker, CBRE, Cushman & Wakefield, Jones & LaSalle, and Colliers International. I've specialized in commercial development and investment grade properties, um, and I'm really familiar with investment grade properties between 20 to $100 million. Um, and I've helped generate over $800 million in net wealth for hundreds of investors throughout my career. I started investing personally when I was 23, and I've acquired over 15 properties across Australia since. And this is my sort of um, career um, uh, 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 time span. Um, as you can see here, I spent over 17 years uh, working for the largest global commercial real estate firms such as uh, CBRE, Colliers, Inter uh, International, um, Jones Lang LaSalle, Cushman and Wakefield, LJ Hooker. And I've also um, founded um, a company called Commercial Property Millionaires, where I um, personally coach investors who want to invest in commercial properties. So why is this relevant to you guys? Um, because I'm someone that has a very strong reputation in the industry. Um, as you can see here, um, I've been interviewed by a number of mainstream media, such as, you know, the Australian Financial Review, um, Sydney Morning Herald, and I've also been interviewed um, many times by the Real Estate Journal as well. So what you see here is probably 5% of all the interviews that I've had been involved in. And in terms of my portfolio, this is my portfolio, just a quick snapshot. Uh, I'm showing you here not to brag, but, to, but again, just to give you guys the confidence that you're you know, being presented by someone who's been there and done that, um, that knows what he's talking in regards to property investments. Um, this is my current team. So we've actually got a team of 12. We've got two new staff that just joined us. Haven't added them to uh, the, uh, the slide yet, but we've got a pretty big team, pretty well-established team and a team of property veterans. So enough about me and us. So back to AJ, RJ and John. So their question to me was, hey, Will, what are NDIS property investments? And this is probably why you guys are here as well. So my question is, is it a hybrid between residential and commercial property? Okay, so I would like for you guys to ponder that for a moment because I think this is probably the best way for you guys to understand what NDIS properties are. Okay, and given my commercial property background, I definitely have the authority and experience to talk about this. So let me just explain a little bit more about NDIS and, and what it's all about. So here's just a few definitions. So, so NDIS stands for the National Disability Insurance Scheme. So it's a government initiative um, that was launched in 2016 um, to help um, uh, I guess people with disability all across Australia. And one part of, a uh, big part of uh, NDIS is the SDA, which is the Specialized Disability Accommodation. So the SDA um, is an uh, um, NDIS introduced funding stream, uh, providing accommodation uh, to Australians with, dis with a disability. So when this is fully rolled out, the NDIS will provide approximately 460,000 disabled Australians aged under 65 with funding of appropriate accommodation. So how can I invest in this? So in a nutshell, you as the investor have the opportunity to buy an NDIS or an SDA house and land package that gets tenanted by NDIS participants or disabled people slash tenants. Um, and in return, the federal government will rent the property from you and the likely return that you will get um, can be somewhere between two to three times higher uh, than the average investment property um, in that specific location. So how does it work? Um, so these properties um, actually consist of a, a wide range of property types, three bedrooms, four bedrooms, each with en suites, 
Um, it also has the ability to, prov uh, to provide accommodation for an on-site carer um, who looks after the disabled participants. Um, these homes will be provided, um, will provide the tenants a place to live independently uh, and also with people um, at their own age uh, and still receive care if needed. Um, the SDA provider, um, who are the specialized property managers for NDIS properties, uh, they're in charge of sourcing um, these participants and placing them um, in the most suitable uh, NDIS property uh, and also pair them with the most suitable NDIS candidates and skilled carers, okay? So, nice. So, so, so John and RJ basically said, hey, nice. So what are the potential rental incomes? All right, guys, so who wants to know what are the upsides for NDIS property? Just comment, please, on the chat box and just let me know. Who's still interested? Who's still here? Who wants to know what the upside is? for NDIS properties. Anyone close to the computer? Okay, all right, so a few, few, few of you for sure, fantastic. Okay, great. So um, let's have a look at what the potential rental incomes are. So the potential rental income will be dependent on the category of NDIs or SDA housing. So there are five uh, categories and they range from basic all the way to high physical support. So as the names suggest, basic are for basic care for people with the uh, least amount of um, support required uh, and high physical support uh, is the highest category for people, for participants who require the most physical support. Um, what I've uh, done in this table is just highlight the two, uh, I guess, most common types of NDIs properties, being um, house with two residents and a house with three residents. Um, as you can see here, in the middle, um, this is the maximum potential rental that you can get. So for example, um, for house with two residents, for a basic category housing, the maximum potential rental you can get per annum is $32,869. And for a high physical support based on a house with two residents, the maximum potential rental you can get per annum is $110,221. And for a house uh, with three residents, um, the basic will be $44,897. Uh, and a high physical support uh, will be 156,134. Okay, and on the right hand side, that's the, um, the rental you, that you'll get um, based on a per room calculation. So this, this information is all available publicly um, on the NDIS uh, websites. Um, you just need to know where to look. Okay, and, and this, this calculator, you can actually download as an Excel um, for you guys to kind of work out exactly what is uh, what is the, uh, the income for each of these categories. So let's have a look at a, um, an example of one of these properties. So this is a, um, a four bedroom, four bathroom, double garage NDIS uh, property. Um, the total price uh, for this package is 887,000 um, for a full turnkey. Uh, and it is uh, based on a, the robust category design. So based on the robust category income, uh, this translates to about 14.8% gross yield. Okay, so extremely, extremely lucrative rental income. So at this point, everyone that I speak to, I say, shut up and take my money. I want to buy this investment property right now because where on earth can you buy an investment property for less than a million bucks? That's going to give you 14.8% rental yield. Like where? Where? Anybody, any ideas? If you do, feel free to comment on the chat box. I want to see if you guys have come across any other type of investments, less than a million dollars. That's giving you 14.8% rental yield. 
feel free to, uh, nope, no one? Nope, I haven't either. But here are the things that you need to know that most people won't tell you. The upside for NDIS or SDA housing investments is very obvious and very clear. You can get upwards of, you know, 15, 16, 17, 18% gross rental yield. But that is only what you see in advertising. And this is only on a perfect world scenario where everything's working for you perfectly. So before you guys jump into NDIS properties, it's extremely important you guys um, understand what I'm about to tell you because most people won't tell you what I'm about to tell you. So John and RJ asked me exactly the same question. So what are these things that I need to know? Okay, so number one is even though the high physical support category are gonna offer you the highest potential rental, that category only makes up approximately 6% of the total SDA housing demand. Second point you need to understand are that the ongoing fees are very, very high. Number three is the vacancy rate is a major factor at the beginning of the ownership of an NDIS or an SDA housing um, because it could take up to six to nine months to fill the property with, with participants. Number four, major banks don't like NDIS properties and valuations via major bank will not stack up. Number five, capital growth, capital growth uh, for these type of properties will be limited during the first few years because of the additional upfront cost of upgrades. And finally, an exit strategy needs to be clearly defined in the very unlikely event that NDIS gets canceled by the government or demand falls. So these are some of the things that you need to consider and that you need to be aware of before you jump into an NDIS property. And I'm gonna break this down one by one. So as I mentioned, the high physical support category or demand only makes up approximately 6% of the total SDA housing demand, which means that the, your, your chances of obtaining the full potential rental under the high physical support category is 6%. Okay, so which means it's probably very unlikely you're gonna get the full $153,000 in potential rental income. On the other hand, just to let you know that the robust category um, actually makes up majority of the SDA housing demand. So, from a feasibility perspective, it's probably better to base your feasibility either on the robust category income um, or the, um, the fully, uh, uh, fully accessible uh, category income. Now, sorry, there's one thing I forgot to mention, if I, if you, if I may just uh, circle back a little bit. Out of the five categories of NDIS properties, um, robust category, is specifically for people with mental disability, like dementia, Alzheimer's, um, autism, et cetera. The other four categories deal specifically with uh, physical disabilities. Okay, so ongoing fees, as I mentioned, the ongoing fees are quite high for, um, uh, uh, for an NDIS property. So, here uh, in this table um, are the range of fees and, a, and the typical fees that an SDA provider will charge you. Um, as I mentioned, an SDA provider um, is, for lack of a better word, is a specialized um, property manager that looks after NDI's properties and also in charge of finding participants. And also they can um, uh, also help you um, lodge your application to NDIS and organize those fundings that you get from NDIS from the government. So here are some of the typical um, fees, ongoing fees. So onboarding, so 
most NDIs providers will charge you an onboarding fee when you sign up with them. Um, the cheapest I've seen so far is 2200 um, all the way to five and a half um, thousand. Tenant sourcing fee, which is um, you know, a leasing fee per resident, can range anywhere between five and a half thousand to 11,000 per resident. Management fee, um, they can range anywhere between 9.9% to 16.5%. Building land on insurance, about 1,500 to 2,000, so not too much more. Um, and there are also um, administrative costs as well, um, including acquiring external documents, et cetera, which can be anywhere between 1,100 to $6,600 uh, per annum. So as you can see, the ongoing fees are actually quite high um, to own a property. Um, so let's have a look at what, a, what the cash flow could look like based on a best case scenario. So on a best case scenario, using the example that I've just shown you, uh, which is the four bedroom robust property, the maximum uh, income that you can generate from this property in a perfect world is $131,981. And then obviously your expenses would include your mortgage, which is probably going to be around $34,675. I'm going to elaborate on that in a second. You've got your uh, you know, council rates, water rates, et cetera, about $3,000, your insurance, about $2,000, your management fees. It's going to work out to be about $21,770. Uh, your repairs and maintenance, um, and obviously the sub-administration costs. So your total net cash flow before tax in a perfect scenario is going to be about $64,000, also about $65,000. Not bad. Not bad, right? But this is on a best case scenario. So the next thing that I wanted to talk about is what are the funding options and why, what can you expect from a major bank and what you can expect from a specialized lender? So using the example um, that I've uh, uh, given already, if we base this property off a turnkey price of 887,000, if you go to a major bank, the valuation will most likely come in at between 650 to 700,000. Why? Because the banks use a short form valuation and they're just going to look at this as a standard home. They're not going to take into consideration all the upgrades involved with an NDIS property. So which means that even if you go for the maximum LVL 88% or 90%, the equity that is going to be required for you to buy one of these properties is going to be somewhere between 298,000 to 342,000. That's including everything. So including your purchase costs like stamp duty, legal costs, LMI, NDIS fees, et cetera. Interest rates, obviously going to be a standard home interest rate, probably somewhere between three to 3.3% 3 .3 um, in today's sort of uh, interest rates. Now, if you go to a specialized lender, which is what I would obviously recommend, um, the valuation is likely going to be somewhere between 750 to the contract price, 887,000. Um, and that's because they use a long form valuation method, which takes into consideration the upgrades and also takes into consideration the extra rental that's generated uh, from this property. Um, the thing is with valuations, in a, particularly in Australia, is not an exact science. So, um, we have seen instances where valuations have come in slightly under the contract price, but in most uh, cases, it does come in in the contract price. But as an investor, this is something that you need to be aware of and also account for um, if you were to go down the path of buying and investing in an NDIS property. So you know, based on, on this uh, assumption, the equity that will be required is going to be somewhere between 133000 uh, to about 254000 including all your purchasing costs, stamp duty, legal, LMI, et cetera. Typical interest rates for a specialized lender is going to be somewhere between you know, 3.49% uh, to about 3.79%. There are lenders a little bit higher, but these are just typical interest rates. Now, next, I want to talk about vacancy. Okay, so 
vacancy rate, um, especially in the first year of ownership, plays a major part in your cash flow. Because as I mentioned, um, it could take six to nine months to fill your property. Because imagine this, you've got, um, using the, the example that I mentioned, you've got four bedrooms, obviously three um, are dedicated to um, NDIS participants and one reserved for the, uh, for the carer. So you're trying to fill three rooms. Um, and even though there is a strong demand um, for NDIS participants, um, a lot of times it does take um, a while to process a lot of these applications. So if, we're, if we were to uh, assume the worst case scenario, that's going to take nine months to fill the property, um, you could be out of pocket um, up to $60,000 before tax during the first year of ownership. Just bear that in, bear that in mind. Um, next thing I want to touch on is capital growth. So capital growth, as I mentioned, will be limited in most cases um, during the first few years because of the additional offering costs for the upgrade. So um, a typical, um, uh, uh, a comparison to a typical standard home um, uh, uh, is that the NDIS property is going to cost probably around $200,000 more uh, when you compare it to a standard home in the, in the same location. Um, so therefore, um, most likely it's going to take a few years for the market to absorb the higher cost. Um, so that's why the capital growth will be limited during the first few years. Um, An exit strategy, um, which is the final thing that I want to talk about, is um, in the really unlikely event um, that NDIS gets cancelled for whatever reason um, or demand you know, falls away, what can you do um, with this property? Like, what is the exit strategy? Um, so this is something that you need to be, you need to carefully plan out. In my opinion, I don't think NDIS is going away anytime soon, but in the unlikely event, it does, what can you do? Well, there's, I guess there's a few things that, that you can do. You know, one is you, you do have a property um, that is probably in a growing um, location um, and most likely you're probably gonna buy a three or four bedroom sort of configuration. Um, you can most likely rent the property out to the general public without doing too much to the property um, or potentially you can sell the property. Um, as a standard home, again, without doing too much to the property. It's going to come down to the timing of it. Obviously, if you've owned property for 10 years, um, it is probably safe to assume that you have generated some capital growth and that you probably will make a profit. Um, if you want to keep the property, then there are alternatives. You can continue renting it out um, to the general public um, or you, know, you might rent it out as a co-living property, given that you've got on suites. Um, with, uh, with all these, um, with, with all the rooms. Um, so it's very important that you clearly define what the strategy is gonna be for yourself before you get into an NDIS property. So now that you know the pros and cons um, of NDIS investing, what do you think RJ and John has to say about it? So this, this is RJ's reaction. RJ says, hey, I think NDI's property is an ideal last piece to my portfolio so that I can reach $100,000 in passive income. I currently have a solid portfolio um, and income that can take on the potential risk. So after acquiring NDI's property, I'm gonna look forward to leveraging the extra income so that I can enhance my borrowing capacity to acquire other properties. So obviously NDI's property works for someone like RJ. What about John? John, John's response is, look, I think NDIS is an amazing cash flow play, but it's too risky for me at this stage of my investment journey. So Will, what else can I invest in to grow my portfolio quickly to reach $100,000 in passive income? And what we actually did for John is we actually helped him secure two properties um, using the equity and income that he, he has. One is a co-living property, um, a price of about uh, 678,000, giving John a yield of 5.7%. In this scenario, um, he, he's, the equity that he required to put down was about 130,000. 
and the net cash flow that he generated from this property after all his outgoings mortgage repayments is about $16,000 per annum. Uh, and this property has grown by 17.4% in the last 12 months. We also helped him secure a Jork property uh, at a price of $560,000, uh, giving him a yield of 6%. The equity that he used uh, was about $90,000, and the net cash flow generated from this property was a little bit over $15,000. Um, and the capital growth over the last 12 months has been 13.8%. So the question now that I want to throw to the audience, um, you know, to everyone who's still watching this webinar, is are you someone like RJ or are you someone like John? Do you think NDI's property suits you or do you think NDI's is, is a type of asset that you might buy later on. So feel free to comment. I just want to see what everybody thinks. Because my personal opinion is NDIS properties is, is a great investment, prop, uh, great investment opportunity. But as I mentioned, it's probably not for everybody. It really depends on what um, stage of your investment journey that you're in. So why don't we have a look at maybe some, um, you know, some other um, high yield alternatives in NDIS. So Jason, thank you for replying. Um, you know, great. You know, you're a diversified investor. So fantastic. KN, maybe a step back from NDIS. Yeah, maybe, maybe, but maybe there are um, some alternatives to NDIS high yield properties, which, I'm happy to explore with you guys right now. Some other alternatives, you know, job occupancies, as I mentioned, like this is a job occupancy this, that was uh, one of our members bought in Cessnock um, in the Hunter region of New South Wales. So this was bought back in April last year for 661,000. Um, it offers a, a rental yield of 5.8%. And if you guys have been following the Cessnock market, it went up by about 32% over the last 12 months. Co-living property, um, which I kind of love at the moment. Um, so this one was bought uh, beginning of the year um, for about 669,000, um, offers a, um, a rental return of about 5.7%. Um, and this suburb went up by about 23% over the last 12 months. So crazy, crazy growth. Um, and then finally, some sort of coastal areas. So this one is in Southwest Rocks in New South Wales. It's just a standard house and land but it offers a 6% rental return. And also this location went up 26% in the last 18 months. So now that you know some alternatives to NDIS properties, um, what I want to talk about is that now you have a choice to make. So the choice is you can go and find some of these alternative properties or NDIS properties on your own. Um, you can try to figure out whether a property is, you know, um, uh, uh, suitable for you or not. Or um, you can book in a call with me um, and, you know, we'll have a quick chat. I'll have a quick assessment of your current situation. And then I can advise you whether or not NDIS is for you or not. So if you'd like to take me up on this offer, um, I will uh, now just um, post a link on the chat. Um, and if you like, just uh, follow the link and book in a call with me. Um, it would just be a 15 minute phone call. Um, and I can give you some advice on whether or not um, this is going to be suitable for you. Um, now, I want to open up for questions. So um, I'm going to unmute everybody's uh, uh, microphones. And if you guys can be courteous and try not to speak over one another. Um, I will open up to um, uh, two questions right now. 